Tonight we're focusing in on Zoom with Galaxy AI on the new Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Ah, a baby tiger. Check out his claws as he prepares to pounce on that frog. Close one, but not as close as this Zoom. We can literally count the whiskers and... Oh look, Mum's here. Good thing I'm nowhere nearby. Go wild with Galaxy AI on the new S24 Ultra and zoom in on the epic day or night. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast, Hour 3. Hello, America. It is Eric Erickson here across the nation. The phone number is 877-973-7425 should you wish to be on the program. Now, I want to talk about uh, conversations I have had. I can't go into a ton of detail, but I, I will just note this. I got to spend some time uh, with some very knowledgeable uh, people over the weekend uh, talking about the state of our economy and had private conversations, had some public conversations. And I will just tell you, I have had this, well, let let me just say, I've had this fear that doom is upon us, that uh, the economic freefall we are about to go through is going to be extremely painful. And there have been some articles out there saying, oh, we could be heading for a depression instead of a recession or even a great recession. And I'm a little, I'm in a better headspace having talked to people who would know. So in these conversations, what came up over and over again is that as bad as it is in the United States, it's actually worse in other countries. Our national debt is um, 125% of the 125% of GDP. That means our debt, the amount of money we owe exceeds the amount of money our economy produces. 125%. That's a staggering number. And other countries are just as bad. Other countries are even worse. In fact, China came up repeatedly, and these were well-noted financial people uh, who have been deeply involved in shaping American fiscal policy over time. And what I found encouraging is a growing belief, not just from them, but from others that I've talked to, that China is actually not on the rise. We all talk about and presume China is on the rise, and it might actually be that China is on the decline. That China is very much like Japan in the 1980s. That came up more than once. So I remember when I was a kid, the the Japanese were dominating. In fact, it, it got so bad in this country in the 1980s that there would be uh, boycotts of Japanese products. People would buy Toyotas and smash them to say, don't buy Japanese. Uh, the American auto manufacturers were under assault by the Japanese. And a whole lot of people in this country began learning Japanese because they were convinced Japan was the future. I know people who did this. I know people uh, who were uh, in college or in finance, and they decided they needed to learn Japanese because the Japanese were kicking our butt. We had bailed them out after World War II, rebuilt their civilization. They were about to take over, and then they did not. And so much of the conversations you hear about Japan, we're now hearing about China. The Chinese are dangerous. Don't get me wrong. I'm not dismissing the dangers of China, but China as an economic threat, probably not the same thing. There was actually a very interesting report over the weekend that China built Ethiopia, a metro system, a public transit system. Seven, six years later, the whole thing is collapsing. It just didn't work well. And I hear that a lot about China. You know, uh, Thomas Friedman is a big advocate of China and the Chinese economy and all things China. And they highlight so much, and I just hear more and more that it's not really true that he overinflates these things, that actually the, the, 
build quality of stuff in China isn't great. They cut too many corners. It's a communist society, so no one wants to raise the red flag. Even the Chinese, they sent out their first major aircraft carrier last year, and it caught on fire shortly after leaving uh, dock. That uh, China looks fantastic, but it's kind of a Potemkin village. And the Chinese economy is doing very poorly. So the Chinese cover up a lot of their debt. You and I cannot figure out how much debt there is in China. The Chinese know, the Chinese know, but the Chinese aren't very public about it. And the Chinese, as a result, have covered up a lot of their debt, it seems. And in covering up a lot of their debt, um, it, the picture of just on base we know in public is, is far worse than what is actually there. The problem we have, though, and let's get back to our debt. Everybody else has this. But here's what you got to understand. When interest rates were at zero, the debt service payments weren't bad. You see, we only have to pay the interest payments on our debt. We don't have to actually pay the debt. We got to pay the interest payments on the debt. And as interest rates grow, go up, it grows. So a four or five percent interest rate, suddenly you're you're a trillion dollars in just debt service payments. Well, how then do you fund national security? How then do you fund education? How do you fund social services? How do you fund social security and and um, Medicare, Medicaid? How do you how do you fund these things? Our budget is not the budget that most people think of. See, the federal government spends on interest payments on the debt and on uh, non-negotiable, non-adjustable fixed things, Social Security and Medicare, actually spends way more than on the negotiable, fungible parts of the budget where everything else comes from. And as interest rates go up, the debt service payments take up more and more of it. So we've got to do something about the debt. Uh, One of the suggestions has been PAYGO. Let me explain PAYGO. George H.W. Bush actually lost his reelection on this. If you will recall, George H.W. Bush in 1988 gave his convention speech. Philip, you won't recall this. You weren't born then. But George H.W. Bush gave his convention speech and said, read my lips, no new taxes. Everybody loved it. Everybody was excited about it. And then he got elected and broke his promise. He decided that we had run into fiscal crisis And we needed to do something about the national debt, which at the time was like 20% of GDP. And that was too much. So Bush and the Democrats hatched a compromise. Bush would support tax increases and the Democrats would support PAYGO. PAYGO lasted until the early 2000s. And when two planes flew into the World Trade Center in 2001, it was kind of the end of PAYGO. But it lasted otherwise. And what PAYGO set up was a system in Washington where if you wanted to do new spending, you had to either propose a tax increase or you had to propose a spending cut to keep the debt the same. The theory is this. You know what a fraction is, like one over two, three over two? Well, let's just do the jet debt to GDP. So the debt, the number is 125 over 100. This is, look, don't critique my math here. I'm trying to make it simple for everyone. So the top number, 125, that's the debt. The debt is 125% of GDP, so 125 over 100. The numerator is the debt. The denominator is the GDP, 125 over 100. When Dwight Eisenhower was president, we were coming out of World War II, he needed to deal with the debt. It's like 50% of GDP was our national debt. And what Eisenhower decided to do was to try to reduce the numerator, the 50 over the 100. And so Eisenhower raised taxes and he cut spending and it tanked the economy. And it never actually changed the debt to GDP number. 
When John Kennedy then became president, he cut all of Eisenhower's taxes, streamlined the tax code, and the economy exploded. We went from a 90% tax rate to a 70% tax rate. Yeah, our income tax rate was 90%, and nobody paid it. It was so convoluted. It was so complex. Everybody found a way not to pay the income tax. John Kennedy lowered the income tax rate, streamlined the country, made it easier. Or no, it went from 70% to 50%, and uh, suddenly our economy exploded. And so John Kennedy, by exploding our economic growth in this country with the Kennedy tax cuts, he didn't reduce the numerator. He didn't touch the national debt. He did not pay off the national debt. What he did is he grew the denominator. And so suddenly it went from being 50 over 100 to 50 over 500. It became a much smaller debt in terms of GDP. The moral of the story is grow your economy, you shrink your debt. You shrink your debt in terms of GDP. You shrink your debt. So our our debt is 125% of our GDP. If we grow the denominator, grow the the grow the uh, economy, suddenly our debt is, instead of being at 125 over 100 is 125 over 200, and then 125 over 300, then 125 over 500 it becomes a smaller and smaller percentage of our economy. But you have to grow the economy. And we can do this because we're the richest nation. We have the ability as a country to grow our country's economy, but we have to commit to doing it. Now, what do you do to grow the economy? This is the problem. It becomes a political calculation against competing interests. Right now, Democrats and Republicans alike want to have an industrial policy in this country where we repatriate everything from China. We bring home all of our business and manufacturing from China. It sounds good. It sounds patriotic. It's suicide for our economy. Why? Because you can produce a widget in China a whole lot cheaper than you can in the United States. And as much as you bellyache and complain, I can hear you doing it right now, that you're willing to pay more, you're not really. You're you're not. I'd buy the $5,000 iPhone, but you wouldn't. You don't have that kind of money. I barely have that kind of money. I'd have to sell one of my kids first, but I'm okay. That'll save me money in the long run. But nonetheless, I mean, you, you get my point. It sounds great to say repatriate everything from China, but you repatriate everything from China. Your costs go up immeasurably. Your labor costs go up. Your sales price goes up. All of your prices go up. We can get stuff out of China, move it to India, move it to Mexico, move it to other countries, and still be able to get things produced cheaper and more efficiently than we can in this country. When we repatriate everything to this country, we're just driving up our country's costs. And when we drive up our country's costs, your out-of-pocket costs go up. There are ways to innovate in this country without having to repatriate everything. We can uh, deregulate. We can simplify the cost of businesses in this country. We can simplify the cost of businesses in this country so much that some industries will repatriate. Some will, not all of them, some will. We can incentivize it by deregulation. We can incentivize it by cutting taxes, by making the tax code easier, by doing all of these sorts of things to stimulate economic growth. You stimulate economic growth in this country, then suddenly our debt to GDP ratio goes down and we need it to go down. It's a national security issue. And talking to these people this weekend, uh, all of them experts, they all made a couple of points. Our country is so rich, it can put this off for a very long time. The longer we put it off, the harder it becomes to fix. Every other country has the same problem, and we're better off than all these other countries. So we have the incentive to fix it and make our country more economically competitive than these other countries. And lastly, the debt really, really, really does matter and is probably one of the biggest issues we need to deal with. And what's so funny, one of the guys told the story that he used to oversee the national debt for the government. And when it was 35% of GDP, Democrats and Republicans both excoriated him, said it was a terrible thing, we needed to fix it. Now it's 125% of GDP, and no one in Washington seems to care. we got to deal with our debt. It's becoming a national security issue. If you own a small to medium-sized business that kept employees on payroll through COVID, you may have a big cash refund waiting for you. The Employee Retention Credit is a tax credit of up to $26,000 per employee, and now more businesses than ever qualify. The experts at RefundsPro.com specialize in cutting through the red tape of qualifying for this government program. Most of their refunds are over $100,000. Even businesses that have received PPP funds may be eligible, and there are absolutely 
absolutely no fees unless you receive a refund. There's no reason not to apply. If your business experienced shutdowns, limited capacity, supply chain challenges, or even reduced revenue due to COVID, you likely qualify. RefundsPro.com has already helped hundreds of businesses, so don't lose the refund you're owed by missing the deadline. Get started today with a free five-minute questionnaire at Refunds with an S, RefundsPro.com. That's Refunds with an S, Pro.com. Hello there. The phone number is 877-973-7425 if you want to be on the program. Always happy to have you on board the show. Uh, I gotta, I gotta talk about this story a little more. I mentioned earlier and it's, it's kind of a sad story. It's a disturbing story. And when I, I, there are probably more questions than answers here. A family's been found dead in Pennsylvania. They made the joint decision to kill themselves. You, You can't really avoid talking about the politics of this family. Um, They were a church-going Christian family convinced that Donald Trump was going to win in 2020. Their yard was filled with uh, pro-Trump signs and anti-abortion signs. And over the last couple of years, the family became more and more isolated, particularly after COVID. uh, And their politics and their COVID views and their economic views and their religious views all kind of intertwined. The media obviously plays up this sort of story as some sort of uh, Trump cult story, but this happens on the left and the right. And that it happens on the left and the right at the fringes of society should be a warning sign for all of us because so often what happens at the fringes creeps into mainstream society. You hear stories sometimes about people who uh, they are environmentalists. They believe the world is headed to hell in a handbasket and they want off the crazy train and they commit suicide. This has happened more than once. And now this family appears that uh, this family decided the world was gone, that there was no reason to stay in the world because the guy they thought um, was going to save them from the world lost his election. It was stolen from him, they believed. And They committed suicide. Detective Timothy Fink said in a statement Friday that Deborah Daub left a written document signed January 19th in which she spoke of a joint decision by her and her daughter Morgan to end their lives. It referred to the, quote, evil that had mounted against Morgan and did not go into any further details. Morgan, the daughter, And also her father left joint notes indicating the family had planned how to carry out the shootings and made other preparations, including what to do with the family dog and their assets. Those notes were dated January 24th, a day before the bodies were found. Two guns were found at the scene. The shell casings and other evidence support the account put forward by the written documents left behind by the family that all three family members decided to end their lives on January 24th. The mother killed the father, the daughter killed the mother, and then the daughter killed herself. This, obviously, it's not normal. It's crazy town. And again, this is a story you hear about at the margins of society uh, where people with increasingly extreme views have isolated themselves. Uh, They don't want to be dissuaded. They don't want to encounter contrary information that maybe shows them that what they thought isn't true. And you get something like this happening. It's a deeply, deeply sad thing. It, I mean, it, genuinely, this is a sad thing that has happened. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm at a loss for words for it. But I know these sorts of things are happening more and more in society. People, particularly of political persuasions on the far left and far right, becoming convinced that the planet is not savable or the nation is not savable. Uh, they've engaged in a level, I mean, frankly, uh, theologians, I think, would call it idol worship. Uh, they're worshiping something that is not so. And this has now happened. It's it's sad. Um, it is sad. And it's also sad that people on the left are gravitating to the politics of it 
and saying that these are just Trumpy people. This happens on the left and the right, but it's happening. It seems like more frequency these days of, of people on the extremes of society deciding in their lives. And we should hope give these people some hope. Greetings. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here across the nation. The phone number is 877-973-7425. Uh, if you want to be a part of the program, you are more than welcome to be a part of the program. I want to, well, I, I got to talk about the debt ceiling. This is from David Drucker. Oh, he's moved over to the dispatch. Uh, Republican pragmatists in the House of Representatives have a message for President Joe Biden. We don't support a clean debt ceiling increase either. Representative Dusty Johnson said the group of pragmatic conservatives he leads in the House would oppose legislation raising the federal borrowing limit absent an accompanying deal with Biden and the Senate Democrats to rein in government spending and reduce Washington's $31.4 trillion debt. Absent such an agreement, the United States risks defaulting on its financial obligations, conceded Johnson, chairman of the Main Street Caucus, which number 70. I don't know a single pragmatic conservative who supports a clean debt ceiling increase, said the South Dakota Republican. If President Biden decides he wants to be a legislative terrorist who refuses to have a discussion about, who refuses to discuss meaningful action on a $32 trillion debt, then he has the power to hurt America. There's no question about that. This is kind of notable here, kind of notable. So David Drucker, uh, he had been at the, he'd been several places in D.C., including the the Washington Examiner. He's now at the Dispatch, and uh, the conversation around Washington, the conventional wisdom, if you will, among the leadership in Washington, is that oh, it's these crazy Republicans in the House, these House Freedom Caucus guys, roughly forty five of them, that they're going to take us, they're going to go over the cliff. We as a nation are going to have fiscal calamity because of these hardcore conservatives. And the audacity of these conservatives is they actually want some level of spending restraint in Washington, D.C. That's that's what they say they want. And so here they come, and the response is actually um, it's not just the hardcore conservatives. We, the members of the Main Street Caucus, the more moderate Republicans, we want some restraints as well. The White House had presumed that they would be able to get a clean debt ceiling increase through. One of the presumptions was because of a process in the House of Representatives whereby if 218 members of the House sign off on something, you have to bring it to a vote in the House. What the Democrats had explored doing was collecting 218 Republic, 218 signatures, all of theirs plus a handful of Republicans, and force the House to vote on a clean debt ceiling. What's so notable here, what has flown under the radar here, is that a lot of the votes that the Democrats thought they could get came from these guys. A lot of the votes the Democrats thought they could get would come from this Main Street caucus, the more moderate House members for which there are 70 compared to just 45 in the House Freedom Caucus. And now these guys are saying, wait a second, we can't have a clean debt ceiling increase. We actually have to do something about the economy. We have to do something moving forward. And that complicates the problem, that complicates things for This White House, this White House thought they could get away with stuff that now they can't get away with, and it's going to make their job more difficult in the White House to figure out a way forward. They're going to have to come up with something, and the House is saying, look, you keep telling us, show us what you want to cut, show us what you want to cut. It's very simple, and apparently no one is listening to this. What the House Republicans are saying is don't cut anything, just don't grow anything. Hold the size of government steady from 2022. And based on our economic growth in the country, 
we will reduce the size of our debt to GDP ratio if we just take our current spending and don't increase anything. That's not cutting anything. It's holding everything steady. What Joe Biden wants to do at the State of the Union is propose some big spending increases. And then when Republicans say no, he says, oh, they're cutting. They're, they're cutting everything. They're, they're not cutting. They're just not growing. And there, there should be a difference between not cutting versus growing or, or cutting. But to the Democrats, there's none. And this, I think the American people will understand this if the Republicans are united in this and say, we don't want to cut anything. We just don't want to grow anything. If the Republicans come out and say our debt to GDP ratio is 125%, we have more debt than our entire economy can pay for. If our if we we cash in the entirety of our economy, we can't pay for our debt. And so let's just freeze the debt. No more debt. We'll raise the debt ceiling, but in exchange your spending in 2023-24 has to be what we did in 2022. I mean, am I making sense there? I I, I don't want to confuse you. I, I'm just, uh, the point here is that the Democrats say, they show us where you want to cut, Republicans. Show us what part of the budget you want to cut. And the Republicans say, we don't want to cut one penny from the federal budget. We just want to take what we're spending this year and spend the same amount next year, no increase. And the Democrats, well, that's a cut. And to the Democrats, that's a cut because every year the the government tends to grow by a certain percentage. They pass a continuing resolution, not a budget, and they grow the government. But now the Republicans are like, look, let's just keep things the same. And by the way, that would actually work. That would actually help the situation. It's the Democrats who are so ideologically invested in always growing their spending that's causing the problems here. But we could actually, there, there is a resolution here. There, there is a way forward here if the Democrats are willing to go with it. It just doesn't appear the Democrats are that willing to to change up anything. It, it doesn't appear the Democrats are that willing to actually just hold spending steady. Now, that gets me to the State of the Union because the State of the Union is tomorrow. This will be the first time Kevin McCarthy has been Speaker of the House as Joe Biden has done this. So it will be Kamala Harris and Kevin McCarthy, two people from California, sitting behind Joe Biden as he gives his speech to the nation. This is Tim Scott. He was on TV this weekend, a, a potential candidate for 2024. I think you'll hear a lot of glossing over of the real issues that the American people are suffering through. If if we were going to hear something authentic from President Biden, it would be, American people, I'm sorry. I apologize for record-breaking crime, record-breaking inflation, and record-breaking border crossings. What I anticipate, however, is he will talk about nothing for as long as humanly possible and stop talking. What do the American people deserve? They deserve to be inspired. They deserve to be encouraged. They deserve to be inspired. They deserve to be encouraged. He's not wrong. Tim Scott's an interesting guy. I really like him. And he would be great on the campaign trail. Whether he whether he wins or not, um, Tim Scott, I think, would be a welcome addition to the campaign trail. Uh, but he's focused on this, that the, the White House really... Joe Biden is being pretty divisive. He, he claims he's not, but he keeps giving these very divisive partisan speeches. And in the process of doing that, Joe Biden is trying to convince everyone that he in some way has uh, the capacity to lead us into the future. And he's got some bold vision for America. Now, what's so striking here is Joe Biden has been in Washington, D.C. for 50 years. If you're in Washington, D.C. for 50 years and you're only just now telling us about your bold vision for the future, you may not actually have one. Here's Governor Chris Sununu uh, from this week on on ABC. Too little, too late. Look, at the the end of the day, they they saw this balloon coming. This is all about China poking at us. This is all about China testing the American resolve, whether it's with TikTok or the balloon or whatever the thing is going to be next month. They know that that, uh, tensions are escalating and they want to see what kind of leadership we have. And no, the 
the president failed on this one. Should have been a, a lot more transparent, should have taken action a lot sooner and gotten it done. But believe Wait, you me, this can, is can, not can the I, last we're going to see of China. I know the president wishes that, but it's not. Yeah, I mean, that 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 ultimately, that that's part of the problem here. Um, is the Biden administration seems to be tougher on Republicans than they are on China. The Biden administration seems to be more aggressive on uh, Republicans and Trump supporters than they are on on foreign adversaries than they are on Iran than they are on uh, China, uh, and he doesn't have a new vision. I just I I maybe it's just me. It, it, I I admit it could just be me, but you are the president of the United States of America. You're the president of the United States of America, and you're running. Again, it appears you've been in Washington for 50 years. What new do you have to offer America? Don't mean that to sound ugly to the president. I mean, I don't care whether I do or not, but I mean, what can you offer America that you haven't already offered America in the last 50 years? What new idea can you offer us? I don't know that Biden has anything that he can offer us. And that becomes part of the problem for this administration. It becomes part of the overall problem with how Joe Biden proceeds in the economy and proceeds on the political stage to advance the country forward. I mean, what does he have to offer now that he hasn't offered in 50 years? I don't have, I don't know the answer to that. I'm intrigued to see what they actually say tomorrow night. We'll, we'll be covering it. I'm, I'm sure the speech will be tomorrow night. We'll cover it a lot on Wednesday. I just, I've got no idea. What can you add on the national stage that you have never added before? What can you do differently now, Joe, after 50 years in Washington, D.C.? And how do you run for president? Because this State of the Union address will be the launch pad for his reelection. Thematically, I realize we're a year away now, but this is the build year for, for his next presidential campaign. So thematically, we'll, we'll, he'll want to do something. Now, interestingly enough as well, I stand by my prior statements on the State of the Union address. We'll forget it all by Friday. It's one of the, the frustrating things here is on Wednesday, we will play a lot of clips. Charlie will get frustrated with the amount of clips I have him cut for Wednesday. And we will walk through the clips. We will play what the president says. We will nitpick what the president says. By Friday, everybody will have moved on. These speeches don't have the staying power they once did, if they ever had staying power at all. But he does get a chance with the State of the Union to launch, to some degree, his vision for another four years. And after 50 years, I mean, for God's sakes, what can you do now that you haven't done in 50 years? I guess he'll try to come up with something for tomorrow. Along the way, there'll be groups like Patriot Mobile helping conservatives stand against whatever the agenda is, because whatever it is, it's not going to be a good one. Patriot Mobile is a conservative cell phone provider. And if you go to patriotmobile.com slash Eric, you can take your business to them. You get guaranteed great service. They use the same cell towers everybody else already uses. So you get 5G, you get data, you get voice, you get voicemail, you, you, you name it, you get it. And then they take a portion of their profits and they fund the conservative causes you care about. So what Patriot Mobile's business model is, you take your business to them and as they grow their profits, they then grow the conservative movement with their profits. So you just become a cell phone uh, customer, take your existing phone number or get a new phone number from them. If you have an unlocked cell phone, take that or get a new one from them. And then you're just, instead of being a customer of one of the other companies, your current cell phone provider, you are with Patriot Mobile. And then they take their profits and instead of funding wokes, they fund conservatives. The Second Amendment movement, the pro-life movement, conservative candidates for school boards around the country, Patriot Mobile helps them all. You go to patriotmobile.com slash Eric today, patriotmobile.com slash E-R-I-C-K, or you can call them. 972 Patriot. They have 100% US based customer service. Tell them I sent you. Get free activation with my name, 972 Patriot or PatriotMobile.com. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number 877 973 7425. Should you wish to be on the program? Um, now I got to talk about Nicole Hannah Jones. You know, the 1619 Project Girl. She's back in the news. Uh, I want I want to, well, play you a, a couple of pieces of audio here. Uh, here's one. 
what we have to decide as Americans is, is which country do we want to be? Do we want to be the country that begins in 1619 with the practice of slavery? Or do we want to be the country that was conceived in 1776 with the ideas of liberty and equality? Um, I think that is, uh, that's unknown. I think we always uh, are seeing the tension and the fight between these two halves. Now, notice what she does there, because originally she said that we were 1619 was our story. Now she says we got we got to decide 1619 or 1776. What do we want? She herself appears to be walking back some of her uh, more sensational claims. And and for those of you who don't remember, Nicole Hannah Jones is the woman who wrote this, oversaw the 1619 project, turned it into a book, and claimed that the the story of America began in 1619 upon uh, slavery's admission into the North American continent, not actually 1776. And she claimed that somehow America was, was um, e- the country was designed to protect slavery, which isn't true. And to the extent you believe it is true, you have been taught something that is not true. Uh, that wasn't the purpose of the country. And yet that's what she claims, that uh, never mind that Vermont and other states had gotten rid of slavery before the revolution and other states were working on it even during the revolution and thomas jefferson himself said it needed to be gotten rid of no 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 with the 1619 is all slavery all slavery here here's one more thing Yes, well, what we were hoping to do with this, obviously, is is reach a whole new audience who uh, maybe never heard of the 1619 Project or haven't read the essays in the book. And this project has always been making an argument about America that if you want to understand the United States today, you have to understand slavery and its legacy. So we picked the... Um, the episodes based on what are the the most kind of expansive foundational ideas and institutions in America and how might we use this documentary to help people understand them. Um, so it really wasn't that hard. These these were the ones that we felt um, were kind of most critical. And then, of course, the final S. Uh, episode justice is an argument for reparations that uh, if we acknowledge this history, um, then we have to try to make repair. Oh, so money. It's money. Someone once said it's all about the Benjamins. Um, I, you know, this, I, I gotta, I, I gotta say this and it rubs some people the wrong way. In San Francisco, the local government has decided that they want to study paying financial reparations to people who can prove they're descended from American slaves. And they're looking at like $5 million versus it's money they don't have. They're not going to be able to do it financially. And the leader of the of the movement says it's not enough. That's not enough. It's, it's money San Francisco doesn't have. And he says it's not enough. You've got Nicole Hannah-Jones saying essentially that if you buy into her argument on 1619, then you must conclude that reparations should happen. What about the blood of the Union soldiers of the United States who died to free the slaves? Was that not reparations? Uh, you, you know, it, it really is. Um Jesus Christ can shed his blood to save mankind, uh, but these people want money. Uh, too bad Jesus didn't just throw around money and, and, and say, here, God, here's some money. Forgive these people. Their sins. They, 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 this is a shakedown is what it is. Union soldiers died in the fields of America to free the slaves, and these people are like, oh, we need money. We need money. It's, it's. I guess, to quote Ilhan Omar, I guess it was, this is all about the Benjamins for them. Uh, it, it's absurd. Reparations is a non-starter financially, practically. It's just a dumb, dumb thing. Hey, guys, time to get in on the action for the biggest moments in basketball with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, place your entry, and win up to 100 times your money right now. Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks. Pick more. Pick less. It's that easy.